Okay, everybody, there's no time like the present. We should get started. We, we have a, a full house. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, this is our second um, practitioner related colloquium of the year. So I'm really happy to see the turnout. I want to welcome um, Rick Carnish. Uh, Rick is one of the founders and also the executive director of the High Speed um, Rail Alliance. And uh, he's a native Chicagoan and long passionate advocate for high speed rail here. And the Alliance uh, advocates for expanded economic opportunities and reduced carbon emissions through integrated rail networks connected by new high speed lines. And Rick has uh, been learning from global best practice, global best practices, and in fact has been uh, riding high speed trains in 10 countries around, around the world, um, if not here in Chicago. So uh, with that said, uh, we welcome uh, Rick Harmish, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming, and I'm sorry that the room is so crowded, but that's a good sign. Right? So um, again, I am the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance, and uh, we started uh, in the long ago times with a simple idea. Uh, we were founded in 1993, and uh, Madrid and Seville are about the same distance as Chicago and St. Louis, Paris and Lyon. Are about the same distance as um, Chicago and St. Louis. In 1993, both of them were two hours and 20. I'm wrong. Madrid to Seville was two hours and 20 minutes. Paris to Lyon was two hours. Um, so our goal, our founding goal, is Chicago to St. Louis in two hours and 20 minutes. Now, if we were to build this Chinese style, you could probably get that down to nine minutes. If you were to go with current European practice, you're still you're down under two, but I'll be happy if we can get the two hours and 20 minutes. Today, it's five and a half hours if the train moves. Which is interesting because before high-speed rail started, it was five and a half hours between Madrid and Seville, and you could pretty much count on the train being late. So just opening that high-speed line created a huge uh, change in the way people thought about trains, the funding that went into trains and the culture of actually running these trains. So um, we're very social people. We're all here together because things work better when you're there in person. Uh, we can do a lot on the, on Zoom, uh, but you can't do it all. Uh, and so, and we've also become very spread out as a country with people going to school over here and they've got to get a job over here and maybe uh, somebody loses their job and they can get another job in a place 90 minutes away or a couple of miles away. I'm having a hard time to describe it. The example that I have is I met a woman in Fort Wayne who had lost her job. So every day she drove into Chicago back to Fort Wayne, Indiana, because um, that was the only job she could get. She didn't want her children to move. She couldn't afford to move. Um, which so if we had had high speed rail, which we should have to Fort Wayne, that would have solved that problem for her. And the other good thing is you can actually talk to each other face to face while you're on the train. So uh, trains frequently have tables. You don't have to sit at a table. You can sit at a table. There's no seatbelts um, because unlike cars and planes, uh, they don't crash very often. And when they do, the dynamics are such um, that the people inside are protected even though there aren't seat phones. So that means you can get up and go to the restroom whenever you want, which at my age is a, a primary issue product. Um, and then the last is no putting your laptop away. When you get on the train, you sit down, you start your laptop, you run the whole way through. So it's a very different experience and you can drop down into the middle of a city or even a town uh, because trains can get into the middle of town where planes can't, and buses can't either. Uh, so I got involved in this again long ago. Uh, in the late 60s, I loved going to downtown Cleveland with my family and my parents. Um, the train stopped running in 1971 to Cleveland. Um, I was very upset about that. I was very upset about this beautiful train station that now was empty. Um, and very shortly after that, Midland started to decline very, very rapidly. Now, there's a lot of complex factors involved in why Cleveland declined, assuming you've already seen decline. 
One of them was we decided that everybody should be able to drive and park, right? And once you've done that, you destroy the ability to walk. Um, and so, but if you go back to places that didn't do that or realize that was a mistake and undid it, and they have trains, you'd have very walkable, nice communities that are less expensive to operate than our cities are. So one of the reasons we've got severe challenges with civic finance is we've got too much road to maintain. We've got too much pipe in the ground to supply water. We've got too much electricity in the ground. The post office is more expensive to run because everything's so spread out. So trains can be a catalyst for bringing us all back together and making cities work much better together. And this is a small town, it's Limburg, Germany. The high-speed train doesn't actually stop in the middle of the town, but this is walking distance from the community. Um, so um, we created a myth in 1956. Um, we created a myth that gas taxes and, and other kinds of taxes like that would pay for our highways. Now, what we did was if you were a federally subsidized highway, the federal portion of that would be paid for with those taxes, but the local roads weren't. The parking lot that then you subsidize because you have paying higher prices for your goods because that store has to pay for the parking lot, et cetera, et cetera. That all rolled up into this machine where we just kept building more and more highways. Somehow we decided that our prosperity and highways were totally related. And if we wanted to be prosperous, we would tear down more buildings and we would build more highways. So we destroy more, more farmland and we build more highways. So we got to the point that this is the federally subsidized highway network. Um, so just get out of your head, which maybe you don't, but folks my age believe that highways pay for themselves the gas taxes is completely um, and so a recent attempt to figure this out is here. There was actually a federal agency that um, studied this in the 90s and they demonstrated conclusively how much the subsidies were going into road construction, et cetera. And Newt Gingrich put them out of business shortly after they published that report. So that just goes to show. But here's a nonprofit that did the same work and California gets close. Washington, Montana, Indiana, and Tennessee get close to their state programs being funded with, with gas taxes, but no other state does. So it is appropriate for federal government and state governments and local governments to invest in railroad infrastructure. Um, I would prefer that we subsidize this less so that their trains make sense on their own more, but that's where we are. So to make this work, there's a number of factors that you have to get to. Um, one is trains work on volume. So you have buses feeding into the trains. Um, you need speed. Speed is relative to what your market is. Um, so on this line up to uh, downtown, if you're headed downtown, Metro Electric's fine in terms of speed, right? Reliability, it's very reliable. It's very safe. Uh, there could be some safety work done on terms of waiting at the train station and walking to the train station, but it's safe. Metro Electric falls down and it's not frequent. Um, there should be a train every 15 minutes. We've advocated for that for about a decade. We were making progress on it and then COVID hit. But frequency is really critical because you have to be able as a passenger to go, I know that I can count on the train being there. Um, and we're missing that. And then the last piece is the cost of the ticket that's not on here. And again, Metro Electric doesn't hit that. It should be the same price as taking the bus to Compton. If we could do that, then a lot more people would take that train. So you'd have much better access to downtown if you could connect it to the airport, it's going even further. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are the things you have to do. And they all mean investing in track. Um, better trains, electrification, and better stations. Now, we have a problem in the way we do design work in this country. We decided um, that trains work between big cities within, you'll hear this a lot, high-speed rail works with big cities between 100 and 300 
or 400 or 500, depending upon how broad that person is. Because you're in, in that range, that's where high speed rail works. That falls down. Or where that was founded from was it used to be you had to allow an hour to get to the airport, an hour in the air, and an hour to get from the airport. That's three hours. Today, a high speed train can cover downtown to downtown in 500 miles in three hours. So that's where that comes into, right? But now it takes two hours that you've got to allow for one hour at the airport, an hour to get to the airport if you're lucky. Um, you've got all kinds of other things. Air flights are getting longer instead of shorter. The problem with thinking about this is this way is, let's look at just Chicago and Indianapolis. You've only got the opportunity to ride the train between Chicago and Indianapolis. If you had a couple of stops in here, then that makes this network diagram get too complex, but maybe there would be one stop if we were building high-speed rail, right? But it's very limited opportunity to take that train. So when we are doing studies as a country, because we think city pair to city pair, we miss the potential to add a lot of track. So each of these has been looked at by state officials and they've all said, it doesn't justify a lot of ex uh, expenditure. Rockford, so we finally have an agreement on how we're gonna get a couple of trains to Rockford, not enough to really make that train work, but it's all the state can justify based on looking at Chicago and Rockford. Milwaukee, we've got seven, it should be hourly, same thing. Muncie, they said, no, it's not worth doing et cetera, going around because they only look at those city pairs. But what happens if you consider the whole thing at once? Now you've got a lot more people using the whole thing. You can make this becomes hugely valuable. And if you can take this, today it's five hours. It should be no more than two and a half on the existing railroad. But if you built a new high-speed line there, that becomes 60 minutes to 90 minutes. And then all of the connections get faster too. So what we really need the state to do is create a plan like this. We, we actually need a regional plan, but the state is doing this right now with a group called the Illinois High-Speed Railway Commission. Um, and I'm a commissioner trying to get them to think this big on that commission. Well, that's step number one. Um, in this network, we've got different types of track um, so shared use is probably going to be about 80% of it. That's what you're used to on, if you take a metro line that's not the metro electric, you're sharing it with freight trains. This is out towards Elburn on the UP West, um, where you take an existing railroad and electrify it within the cities or maybe out in the country to be focused on passenger trains, but it may have freight trains on it. We call that regional line. And then high-speed lines where you build completely new. Um, and in China, the fastest trains are going 217 miles an hour. So we round up to 220, um, but at least 125 <laughs> in our definition of a high-speed line. Um, these trains, the high-speed trains, can go on regional, probably not shared use because freight trains beat up the track really bad, and it's a high-precision vehicle. You don't want it to get messed up. We call this type of service, if you get to the right kind of frequency, regional rail. So essentially, the type of trains that we're promoting are high-speed rail and regional rail. Now, if we actually had a railway program at the federal level, where would we build new high-speed lines? And this is the best analysis I've seen. I'm sure there's some way of justifying Fort Wayne to St. Louis or Kansas City, um, but... Uh, this is probably what we need. And so this seems big, right? Again, if you're, if you're a small thinker about this 500 miles, it doesn't work, but it even does if you're 500 miles. Because Minneapolis, Chicago's 400, Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Atlanta, right? Each of those, and then you've got overlaps. So it still makes sense. But if you did high-speed rail from Chicago to Atlanta, you could probably get that down to four or five hours and you're beating the plane for downtown to downtown. The longest train that I've found that runs at high speed in the world, this was a couple of years ago, I'm pretty sure it's still true, is Beijing to Hong Kong in seven hours. That's all the way from Chicago to Miami. 
So Chicago or China's already built more than this. Um, and today, uh, there's a small segment under construction in California. Uh, they just got a federal funding commitment to build high-speed rail from Las Vegas to the LA suburbs. Uh, so they're putting together their final financing. They hope to get that uh, under construction in the spring. And the best example of regional rail in this country where you're doing a mix of things, partially on shared use, is called Brightline. It's from Orlando down to Miami. And then we've invested most of our money in this country in Washington to Boston, which we, that the Acela train is the fastest train there, fastest train in the country right now, top speed of 150. Uh, we would call that regional rail, not high speed. Um, so who's done what we want done before? And, you know, you hear a lot about California high speed rail, and it's really easy for the opponents to find the mistakes. There's always mistakes, right? We don't know what the cost overruns were at the last round of O'Hare expansion. That project's still not done, even though it's late. And we're starting the next round of O'Hare expansion, and they've probably lied to us again about how much that's going to cost, right? But on California high-speed rail, it's easy to pick out those mistakes and just hammer home on those. But they're actually under construction. And there's so much more about the California program than just high-speed rail. So in 1990, the voters agreed to a big tax increase in order to pay for upgrading their Amtrak service, building new commuter lines, and building new light rail. That was in 1990. So they've got a 30-year and start on us here in, in Illinois. But this is my son and I getting on a train in Oceanside, which is one of the busiest Amtrak corridors in the country because of the investments that California has made. Um, so this is their existing rail network. Uh, you've got the blue lines, our shared use lines. Yes, I'm trying to remember my color schemes. The orange thing, is the once a day Amtrak trains that, that go overnight. And then those yellow lines are buses. So this network all works together. You have one ticket, you can take a bus, not sure why you would, but might take a bus all the way from the northern part of the state, catch it down at Richmond, California, take the train down to Bakersfield, take another bus to Los Angeles and take a, uh, a train to San Diego, that's a long trip, but you can do it all on one ticket and the buses are timed to meet the trains. And they're incredibly frequent compared to what we're used to out here. So they've already got a statewide network. And they are working towards on these lines, like on the LA one where it's really dense and getting to every hour. This is in the Central Valley today. They're working towards every two hours. Central Valley, Valley is very much like the Midwest in terms of the way the cities are structured, the, the population density, et cetera. Um, and they're doing it on a shared use railroad. So if they can do it in California, we can do it too. And this is high-speed rail where they're building new high-speed lines. And I apologize, this map's out of date. San Francisco, all the way down to Palmdale, and then out to Las Vegas, they are now have all the environmental clearances they need to build. Um, and then they've also got Burbank, Los Angeles, and they're redoing Anaheim. The hardest part of building this is Los, Los Angeles to Palmdale. That's really tricky, lots of faults. And then there's a big mountain crossing between Palmdale and Bakersfield. And you go back to this rail network here, oops. You can see there's no train between Bakersfield and Palmstead. So the biggest, biggest game changer will be Bakersfield to Palmdale when it can get the tunnels built through there. Um, and then you can do Las Vegas to Northern California where there's a lot of activity. So they're way ahead of us on high-speed rail. They're on, under construction from Bakersfield to Merced. Hopefully we can get that sped up and they'll have it done by this decade. But the most important thing they've done is they've created a statewide master plan where they know how all of these trains are going to interact together. So that's that network that I talked about before. In this case, it's incredibly complex. It's not simple like that other one 
but the principle remains the same. So this is their long range plan for what trains will look like. And again, it's covering the whole state between buses, high speed rail, et cetera. And this piece in the middle that's in red, that's that new high speed line. That's what makes the whole system work much better together. So they estimate that if they could just get that piece in the middle going to get started, it doubles the amount of people who take the system as a whole, but cuts the cost to the state of actually running those because they're carrying a lot more people. Um, and as this is ridership in 2010, they're updating, they're updating this plan. Uh, this was put together in 2018 and they were going on uh, the traffic from 2010. So these little hoops are ridership between counties by train or connecting bus. All the counties north to south. And I point out Fresno because by Illinois or Wisconsin standards, Fresno is a really busy Amtrak station, but they don't show this because those hoops over there wouldn't be visible. So there's no traffic showing in Fresno today, but the county, but there actually is a lot of traffic. So they figured if all of these projects move forward independently, they get a huge boost by 2040. But if you tie this together as a network, it multiplies everything by 10 times. So that's why this network plan is so important and why we need the state of Illinois to create a true network plan and then get a plan for the rest of the region um, cooperatively with the other states and then push the feds to actually take it. Um, so the feds started this process with a framework. They call it a plan, uh, but it's actually just a framework. It's not a plan. And anything red, green, or purple in their model, it's different levels of service. Um, but all of them require building two new electrified tracks with no gray crossings. So I don't know why they just didn't make all of those colors high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. I argued with them about that, but they did. But so essentially what we're saying is all of this but the yellow definitely justifies high-speed rail. And study after study has shown this. We just don't have the, the institutional structure to do it right. But if we can get Illinois to do it and become the leader, we can make that happen. Another interesting thing happens. They did a similar plan around Atlanta, and they hooked together at Nashville. Unfortunately, they didn't look at how those two would interact. But they do show that high-speed rail is justified from Atlanta to Nashville and from Nashville to Chicago. They did not do this in the East. So you don't see one of the busiest travel markets in North America, which is Chicago and New York being served by train. That's because they didn't put it in their mind. Um, but this is a really exciting framework to get working on, but we haven't really got this process started. So that's what we're advocating for. And we need a lot more people advocating for us to make this actually happen. Um, so this is our vision for what an integrated network might look like in Illinois. Um, and I personally, so these colors are, you have to think about Metra as part of the system. <laughs> Again, we plan downstate differently than Metro. We need to bring those together. So we color coded this by the, the Metro line that they would, trains would use to get into town. Um, if I were in charge, the high-speed line would go on this dotted line here, and then from Champaign up, and some of the trains would stop right out there. Um, and you can do St. Louis to Chicago in under two hours. Um, and in the or University of Illinois, the University of Chicago in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so that really ties the whole system together. So this is what we're working towards. Um, part of the challenge is what do you do about coming into town? So at the beginning, I talked about, imagine if you could go out here to 57th Street and take a train to O'Hare, how much that would change everything, not just because you could travel, because now you can access the suburbs, et cetera. Um, but how do you get through town with electrified tracks? We came up with a proposal called Crossrail that we're trying to persuade the state to adopt. Um, and that's that purple line going from Kensington or, or Pullman up to just past O'Hare. And then those green lines are lines that we could turn into regional lines 
that are focused on passenger trains with electrification on. Again, we're trying to persuade the state to do this. It's a great idea. The state and Amtrak and Metro are working, like if we're talking up here, they're working down here on the same principles. If we can get a lot of people activated, maybe we can move them up. Um, so that's the idea in Chicago. So in Illinois, this is the new federal process that was created with the last transportation reauthorization. So um, it used to be there was a highway fund and the highway fund was spent on highways. And then over every, they, they about twice a decade, that program changes. And each time you get a little bit more into the highway. Um, so there was no federal program at all for passenger trains, except for a little bit for Amtrak. Uh, but now they've created one for how you go through the design process. And unfortunately in Illinois, we're here. We're here on a couple of projects, but because we didn't do this work, right? One of them is Union Station. Uh, they're doing project planning on Union Station, but they're not doing it big enough because we don't have a big system, big enough system. Um, but we are making progress down here. Um, and so what we need to do is get the state to move through this as fast as possible so that we're down at the construction funding the next time there's a big pot of money. Last time there was a big pot of money was in the Obama years. We had some dark years in between. And then we got another big pot of money this year. Or I'm sorry, two years ago. And they started allocating that money a couple of months ago. Um, so that's a very, very quick overview. I, I hope that was useful. Happy to take any questions. If you want to uh, get involved, highspeedrail.us, there's a uh, petition there that you can sign uh, that'll also get you on the newsletter. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering about like costs and funding so, because I remember the last time I flew into New York City mm -hmm. for the holidays, uh, I took the East Side Access from JFK and it was two miles that they spent $11 billion on. Yeah. Um, I know, <laughs> and it was delivered 10 years late. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any initial costs that have been projected for this mm -hmm. and maybe any funding mechanisms. I know New York City is doing the congestion pricing that they just kind of just got approved I think last year. Yeah. So um, do it, just to be clear, do a JFK to the new tunnels underneath Grand Central Station. Yeah. And you made the connection at Jamaica. I did. Yeah. Okay. So the reason I bring that up is this problem with the system at the back. So because airport money is airport money, you can't run a train that has multiple uses into an airport. So what did they do? They built a totally non-compatible system with the Long Island Railroad to connect JFK to Jamaica Station instead of figuring out how to either get the New York subway or Long Island Railroad into JFK. So that's mistake number one. You got an expensive project there. Um, and they used the new technology instead of using proving. So there's step number one. Step number two, Grand Central Station has two levels um, and it's controlled by Metro North. Long Island Railroad is controlled by Long Island Railroad, even though they both report to the MTA, they don't get along. So you got this massive station with two levels, the lower levels not being well used, but they don't get along so Metro North forces Long Island to do the third level in a deep tunnel underneath Grand Central Station. Again, an, ex an ex incredibly expensive project. Now, if we could figure out how to get agencies to work together and cooperate better on a long-term master plan, those kinds of things go a lot better. The same thing is happening at Penn Station in New York right now, where they, the three agencies that use it can't figure out how to cooperate so they're essentially building three separate stations within the footprint. Um, so that's why going back to that system plan and the network plan is so critical. And yes, that they're expensive construction projects, they always go late. And Robert Moses started that, that tradition when he started building highways in New York. 
Uh, he would lie about how long it would take to get built and he'd lie about how much it got to get the project started. We've done highway projects like that forever. So, uh, but that was done. So, and in terms of funding, we, we've got to get Congress to say, we're going to make this work. Right now we're putting billions and billions and billions of general revenue into the highway program. We got to start thinking more about putting it. It's just a question, and you probably hear this a lot, which is how much does this sort of plan still make sense in post pandemic world of increasing the amounts of working from home? So, like last, you mentioned Metro as being part of this, just as an example. Like last spring, we had a talk by someone from Metro who, you know, at least at that point, they, their ridership was still down 40% lower than all the pre pandemic levels, and their struggle that exists to you know, stay afloat. Is most of the traffic on high speed rail that you imagine commuting is work related? And if so, is it still viable in a world if we're going to continue with the rates of working from home that we have now? Is it still economically viable to, to have this kind of commuting rates of rail systems? Yes. So we build a highway and we say a lot of people are going to use this highway, right? In this country, um, rail projects have always been very focused on taking people from a suburban parking lot to a downtown for a day's worth of work. Um, and so Metro is still focused on that. But there's a tremendous amount of traffic that Metro could carry if the trains were frequent enough, if the price was right, and if they went through downtown instead of stopping at time. So that's the discussion about converting Metro to regional rail so that you can take the train throughout the day, not just in peaks so that you can use it for multiple purposes. So you can use one ticket to get from the center. On high-speed rail, again, it's it's lots of different trip types at all times of the day. So you have to design it. And, you know, I, I was in Germany fall of 22, and the trains were all running late in Germany, which goes against their reputation because the trains were over full, overfilled. And they have a thing where you could just get on a train and that they're having a lot of problems with getting all the people onto and off the train because so many people wanted to ride the trains. I was in Tokyo, November of 22, and boy, there were a lot of people riding those trains. The problem is we haven't designed a train network for people want to So that's what we need to do. I think. Is your, so your argument about the, the metrics issues is they just aren't running frequent enough trains? At the wrong price structure, yeah. To the wrong locations, also, it sounds like. And, and partly to the wrong location. Yeah. So here's one particular example. I live next to the Ravenswood Metro stop. My son, this was years ago, but my son, every Saturday, did oboe in an orchestra by what used to be called Fort Sheridan, which is a Metro stop on the same line. But because the train only runs two hours, we drove every Saturday. But if the train had even just run every hour, it was actually time, it would have been time so we could have taken the train because every 15 minutes and no brain, right? Same thing out here on the Metro Electric. There is so much traffic happening between here and downtown and O'Hare that Metro should be much busier. It's just the train doesn't come very often and you have to pay twice. Yes, I'm arguing that the problem is the services. Just okay. Um, Jeremy Lowry is asking, is it wise for high speed rail to rely on the ups and downs of the interim public funding? Um, it seems that Bright Line in Florida managed to flourish despite those dark years. Possibly mm -hmm. to be off largely privately funded. Uh, so there's certainly going to be a mix. Sorry, mm -hmm. Could you just repeat the question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So Jerry Lowry asked, um, is it wise for high-speed rail to rely on the ups and downs of national politics, including public funding? Um, it seems that Brightline of Florida managed to flourish despite those dark years, possibly due to being largely privately funded. Um, so it's really hard to compete with the federal government. And um, then you've got uh, a really easy solution that appears to be cheap as your competitor. It's hard to imagine a business wanting to compete with that. 
And that's the reason why we don't, we've got too many trucks on the road uh, because the railroads don't want to build the infrastructure needed to really be competitive. And we've got too many cars on the road for the same reason. So if we're going to have a good train network, we either have to stop subsidizing highways or subsidize railroads or some combination of both. Um, there is a role for people like Brightline to pay, play in doing this. Um, and certainly Brightline West, um, there was a casino owner that looked forward towards his, the future of his business and said, I better figure out how to get High speed rail to LA. So he invested his own money to design the, system, the line from the O'Hare, from LA suburbs to Las Vegas. Um, and then, now that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have done it. Um, and then he had some problems getting through some regulatory issues, kind of had spent enough on it. Brightline West had experience. The FRA wanted an experienced railroad to take on that project. So Brightline West brought that, bought that project from him. They've done the development. So having a private company in that has moved it forward much more quickly, but they can't do it without a small piece compared to the size of the project, a chunk of federal funds to make it happen. So we have to have federal funds. Um, let's maybe take one more from the chat and then okay. from the audience. Um, what makes, um, so Mitchell Bobbin is asking, what makes a network plan good to get the kind of spillover effect that is expected from California's plan? So what makes the network plan good so there's a spillover? To get the kind of spillover effect that is expected from California's plan. Um, I think what that means is, if, I, if you go back to that train schedule that I showed in the Central Valley where the train runs every two hours, so then that's the spine. And if you do high-speed rail, that probably happens every 15 minutes or every half hour. That's the spine and it shows up at that station at the same time, every increment. Um, then you've got the buses feeding in or the conventional trains feeding in and they're all scheduled to arrive. Uh, the bus would come in before the high-speed train does and leave after the high-speed train. Does, so that the whole system works better together. Um, and then you make it easy for people to use preferably one ticket for that whole episode so that those connections work seamless. I think that's the answer to it. Yes. Uh, so uh, the see that your work revolves mainly around commuter rail, uh, commuter service and intercity services. So um, how do you solve the lost miles problem? Yeah. So last um, mile, last mile is super important. Um, we have chosen not to deal with that, but, um, in Chicago, you have Uber and taxis and you had taxis before there was Uber in many Midwestern cities where you didn't have a strong transit network, there weren't taxis, right? So if you've got people coming into town, the taxi park kind of takes care of itself. Each city needs to figure out how to design its downtown plan around the station. Um, and there should be cooperation with the state and the cities in doing that. Um, and actually, we had an excellent webinar about it last week. We haven't posted yet um, about the San Jose station design that gets into that. So it's a super critical issue, but we can only bite off a big piece of pie. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, like, the environmental aspect of this and how are they able to, like, offset carbon emissions from vehicles, which I think is what train travel does do, um, with balancing that with how they're, uh, from rail implementation and the environmental impact of that. So how do they balance it in making their decisions? Um, uh, there's not a lot of good balance now. Um, we are continuing to expand highways. And so um, the comparison is, um, you can carry a lot more people um, on a railroad line. It's about 10 times as many people on a railroad line as you can a highway. Um, so this is an investment that causes a lot of other savings. Yes. This is building on the previous question, but 
Can you talk about um, the how we deal with high infrastructure costs and rail infrastructure costs in the U.S. where, you know, even if a project is well coordinated um, and, you know, makes it to the state, we're still spending two, three, four times as much like per mile to build rail as you know, in Europe or in Asia. Like if there are any approaches that uh, you all advocate for or think can help to like, you know, uh, bring them to a higher cost. So one of the things is you have to do it on a regular basis. You figure out how to repeat things. Whereas everything in this country is custom. That's one. Uh, Aaron Levy with pedestrian observations. And then he's with a, a New York college. They've done a lot of work on what can happen, what needs to change. Part of it is the coordination that we talked about on the JFK to downtown uh, example. There's a lot. And again, that's super important. And, we're focused on we need to get the program going. But yeah, there's a lot. So if New York sucks up all the rail money because they're doing a $10 billion tunnel and we don't get anything out here, I'm not happy about that. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how regional rail um, shares at least parts of those um, trips with like freight lines, uh, freight trains. Um, is Would newly implemented regional rail include any I don't know any trips that are exclusively for those regional trains because I, I just I took a um, Amtrak train last summer and um, we were delayed multiple times by freight trains kind of cutting in line even though they technically the Amtrak train had priority in that trip um, and I don't know if this is true or not maybe you can speak to this but apparently it was because the fines for cutting that priority for going ahead of the Amtrak trains for those freight companies was cheaper than the cost of those of just waiting for the Amtrak train to go through. Um, so is there any way to kind of implement regional rail in a way that would allow those trips to actually run without delay and prevent freight trains from kind of just like cutting in front? Right. So Metra, most of Metra's lines on, are on shared use lines. Uh, the um, uh, just spaced out the Alburn line, UP West, and the Aurora line, BNSF, are incredibly busy with freight trains. And the Metro trains pretty much run on time. That's because they built the tracks to do both. Um, and the core problem on why Met Amtrak doesn't run on time is because it doesn't make sense as a businessman to invest in track. So since we really started regulating railroads in, in World War I, the railroad network keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So there just isn't enough track to run Amtrak trains well. That gets back to we need to invest in the track. That's the core issue. The other problem is the way Amtrak is structured, they pay a fraction to run that passenger train of what the freight train does. Um, and that's another problem that has to be solved. And they solved it with Brightline in Florida. Um, so it can be solved. They also solved it with the Amtrak service that runs between Sacramento and Oakland. Um, it can be done. It's money is the issue. Yes. So I was an undergrad at the University of Missouri. I'm not even very high for the project was um, commencing and they had brought one of the uh, hyperloop pods onto campus. It was huge spaceship looking exhibit, but that project eventually fizzled out and I had read it was about, we didn't get the regulatory approval. So how do you foresee, um, once you have the funding, what are the biggest regulatory hurdles you see, especially with rails that would be going through multiple states, obviously California and Florida, they're working in the state, but are there barriers to having a rail from Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Missouri, do you have to deal with Obviously, there's federal regulations, state regulations. How do you balance all of that? And would you say that's besides funding, that's the biggest hurdle that these high speed, speed rails face? So I'm sorry, I have to go back to Hyperloop. Um, a friend of mine pointed out that Musk likes to listen to old radio clips. Um, and, it, and my friend found a radio clip from like 1975, 76 where Stanford was doing a study on something very similar to Hyperloop. 
And my friend speculates that Musk was high listening to this clip. And then a couple of days later, he says, oh, I got this great idea. Uh, but the Hyperloop has so many physical problems that while it was being hyped up, I'm like, don't people see these problems? Um, so uh, the problem with Hyperloop was not the regulatory structure. The problem with Hyperloop was it's the dumb <laughs> uh, So if we come back to the state line issue, that's a problem. That is a real problem. And even if you look in Europe, where there's the French network that's focused on Paris, why was it hard for them to get high speed trains between Paris and Frankfurt, even though it's a huge travel market because it's two states? Um, there's the Madrid network around Madrid and the network centered around Paris. They should link well at the state line or at the country border. They don't. Um, so that's a real problem. And that's one of the reasons we haven't made any progress in the Midwest is because Chicago is hugely expensive. You have to fix Chicago to do anything. And Illinois is gonna, not going to take Chicago on by itself. How do you get these tracks into and through the city? Um, Chicago to Cleveland is a really important market. You got three states. How do you get three states to work? You just can't. That's why we come back to it needs to be a federal program. I think that answers your question. Yes. I just had a quick question about our, if you could go into a little more detail about our local situation, particularly the issue in downtown Chicago, you're talking about a, a, a line of some kind that can, you know connects all the way to the airport. And we have these two stations, obviously Ogilvy and Union Station. What, what are the kinds of recommendations and costs that that would incur to actually somehow connect that a little more seamlessly? Because right now taking the L or a car or whatever between stations is not, Right. So um, uh, I forgot to mention the reason this is super important now, and thank you for kind of triggering this, is because Metra has a ser serious financial crisis. So in order to convert to regional rail, they need capital investment um, because we just neglected the Metra for too long. They've still got cars running in service today. You can go ride one that was built in the Pullman factory down in 1956, right? Um, so it's a little out of date. Um, so the legislature is going to take this up in spring of 2025, probably. So what we want them to do is think bigger than just saving metro and getting to actually investing in a metro that works for the region. But the, so we've got the electric line, because we're here, let's use that specific example. That comes up to the lake, right? And it's on the lakefront. Um, then to go out to O'Hare, there's a train that runs five times a day uh, that goes from Union Station out to O'Hare. That's a that's a really important market, south side of the city, O'Hare, very important. And it's not just important because you're going to O'Hare, as I mentioned. There's the expressway corridor where a lot of jobs are. If you could get quickly from here to there and then take a bus out there, that's very different than a lot of south siders today who are taking bus red line, blue line, bus, right? Um, but what do you do about this? So Metro Electric's great. It's got no freight trains on it. It's electrified. It's a four track railroad. That's beautiful. Um, but how do you get across? So we propose rebuilding a freight line there called the St. Charles Airline, which is between 15th and 16th Street. Um, and building it to be electrified and then having it dive down into Union Station. And then there's enough room to build two electrified tracks on one side and keep the freight and diesel metro tracks on the other side, all the way out to the airport. Uh, and so we call that Crossrail. And that's, uh, that's the truly transformative way you start to deal with this stuff. If you build that connection, you could also do Joliet to O'Hare and Aurora to O'Hare. And I'm missing one, right? Juliet, Aurora, University Park, and South Bend and Michigan City. And if you created a transfer station, maybe just right out here where everything stopped, uh, then you can do a lot of really exciting things. So does that answer your question? Is it, and I'm curious if there are any cost estimates of how much that would be. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so remember, they told us it was going to see be six billion dollars to do the runway project at O'Hare. We know that's not true, uh, but that's what they told us it was going to cost. It's again, that's still not done. They did the highway work to support that. It was not in that. And now we're on the next, I forgot what they're talking about for the terminal upgrade, 12 billion dollars, right? So if this is two or three to support that investment that I have as a taxpayer, I'm backstopping the loans on O'Hare, I better, that better be successful. Two or three billion dollars to do this seems like it could, yeah, yeah. So everyone talks about cost, cost, cost. <clears throat> but my question is, to offset those arguments, <clears throat> sorry, how well and is there a way to put to like project what the economic returns on that would be, on what the you know spillover effects of you know that type of mobility could be? Yes, there is a way. We did an initial study in um, twelve that looked at that big Midwest network. Making a rough estimate, it's pretty significant. Um, U of I did a study on just Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis alone. Um, and then uh, the Illinois High Speed Railway Commission is going to do it again for a, a, a network. Uh, uh, so it is possible. Again, it's money to do the, the work. Absolutely. Can you tell us the rough answer to these various studies? How big is Oh, because I'm horrible with these kinds of numbers. Um, if you go to our website, and I think if you put 220 Midwest, search that, you should get a page that has a link to the studies. If not, go to Midwest region page, and then in the upper hand corner, there's a link to the studies. Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have anything. Um, do you mind? Oh, yeah. yeah. One more, um, or what do you mean? Just, um, there's a couple of, okay. uh, just take one here and then we can take his. Okay. Um, so this is from Ozga Hamet. Um, without a public that wants to use public transit in this country, how do you see the high-speed rail changing the way U.S. towns and cities work? Uh, so I do think there is a public that wants to take high uh, transit. It's just the transit's not there. And if it was there, there would be more people who wanted to ride it. Um, so... We have to, at the same time, together, and maybe they don't go at the same right, but we need to change the way our cities are designed to get rid of all the excess parking and make it walkable again. That's one piece. We've got to fix transit, and those two are go together. Um, and then if those two go together, high-speed rail becomes much more feasible. If you build high-speed rail on a couple of key places where it can work even with the existing downtown development, you know, drive those other things as well. So it's a cycle. You know, we we did this over about 50 years. We took very vibrant cities and we converted them into suburbs. It's going to take a while to go back with it. Or it may not. If somebody lobs uh, a missile into Saudi Arabia, it may be tomorrow. we go, well, we got to figure this out. So one of the big players um, that is presumably lobbying against all of this, or not, probably not this big picture, but intercity connections is the airline industry, mm -hmm. right? And when it comes to high-speed rail plans in, in this country, I'm always puzzled that trains and planes are treated as, as substitutes, whereas in reality, they could be complements and sort of interact with each other. So what, what happened in Europe, in a lot of Central European places, is that the high-speed rail was built underneath the airport um, and the airlines started to sell tickets for these trains. And it went up to a point that companies like Lufthansa stopped doing these flights between places. They just sold the, other, the, the tickets on the trains, presumably because it was more profitable. So I was wondering whether they are sort of, because you can see from this from this map that the train doesn't go into O'Hare, but it goes past it. Whether there are some, you know, whether that could be a way to get airlines into sort of into onto the boat and as a, as a strong partner to, to push, because United would be interested to sell, you know, 20 tickets a day to Milwaukee or to, I don't know, Kenosha instead of flying there three or four times, and, and probably they will make a profit on that. Absolutely, yeah. So, and, you know, Frankfurt is a great example. Yeah, um, yeah as well. Uh, there's a number of them. Uh, so actually, uh, if again, if you go to the O'Hare, if you go to the Midwest page, we have a section on O'Hare, and there should be a link to a study where we did a comparison of uh, Frankfurt, Paris, and Copenhagen. 
Um, that's really an issue. The airlines probably are not that concerned about Chicago to St. Louis. Uh, they probably don't want to fly that. It's interesting, there was a true high-speed rail project in Florida um, that one political analyst um, looked at and just came to the conclusion that it was killed not because American Airlines was opposed to it, uh, but because Virgin, Air, Virgin Atlantic was pushing it and American Airlines got pissed off at Virgin Atlantic. Um, so there was an airline pushing for that um, way back when. But yeah, that's we've got to bring these two together. And that's that silo that we talked about on the rail side and the transit side. We've got that, there's a, this crazy thing about airplanes or airplanes and trains or trains. They have to work together. Um, there's some more questions on the chat. Um, this is from Jordan Sosa. Um, do you have any good figures for comparing costs of trains versus costs of highways when it comes to dollars per passenger mile? Um, I had rough calculations myself and found that trains are cheaper with this measure, but he, I can't find this analysis online. Um, I, I'm sorry, when you, when you ask data, I, I keep calling us a faith-based nonprofit uh, because I don't have good, uh, I don't have good data, right? So I know it to be true. I can't demonstrate. <laughs> Maybe out of curiosity, there was I saw there was a big plan for 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 a large high speed rail network in the Midwest, two thousand eight nine or something by SNCF. The, yeah. Branch rail yeah. Um, sort of is is the, is there still an option that and I think it was smashed down for whatever reason it was too expensive and is there is there still are there still plans to bring a foreign actor in with a lot of know how like the the Spanish people the span the Spanish government does with the Italians now to sort of to try to promote that or or, or or you know push that or is that not a thing? So that SNCF study was interesting um, because there was a congressman who really wanted to get private people to take over the Amtrak service between Washington and New York. And there was a congressman um, in Northern Minnesota that really wanted high-speed rail. And so um, the compromise, one was of course a Republican and one was a Democrat. The compromise between them was they would solicit private proposals publicly um, for five now. California, Texas, Midwest, Florida, and Northeast Corridor. And SNCF actually thought they were serious about doing high speed rail, so they did the proposal. <laughs> um, and it's, I'm so glad that they did. But it, it, we still are at the point where the, the feds are really serious enough. But certainly, you don't, the way I explained it recently was you can't plant a garden without seeds. We don't have any seeds in this country to plant the high speed rail garden. So we do need to go overseas. On the Texas project, there is a proposal um, on Texas that Renfe from Spain would be the operator of that. And um, that, that is kind of stalled. We do need to get that expertise. So I think we've, we've reached our time. Oh, uh, people are welcome to stick around and, and chat. Uh, but let us uh, thank Rick for.